Uh, hello, welcome to uh, the third seminar in our series, Writing Slavery into Australian History. Uh, my name is Jane Lydon and I'll be hosting this session. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're holding this event on the traditional country of the Wadjuk Noongar people of Southwestern Australia. Uh, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, I'd also, before I introduce our speaker, <clears throat> I'd just like to say, um, please, any questions, can you use, would you mind using the Q and A function? So you can just write those in. Uh, at the end of uh, Jeremy's talk, um, I will come back and <clears throat> just um, chair a question and answer series through the Q&A function. So please don't use chat, just use Q&A. Thank you. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jeremy Martins today. Um, uh, Jeremy is a chief investigator on our project, Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery. Uh, and he, he teaches and researches here at the University of Western Australia. Jeremy teaches global history, imperial history, and the history of race and racism. His research interests include the evolution of immigration restriction legislation in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, as well as race, gender, and the law in 19th and 20th century South Africa. He's the author of Empire and Asian Migration, Sovereignty, Immigration, Restriction, and Protest in the British Settled Colonies, 1888 to 1907, published in 2018, as well as Government House and Western Australian Society, 1829 to 2009, published in 2011, which was shortlisted for the 2011 Western Australian Premier's Book Awards and received a special commendation in the 2012 Margaret Medcalf Award. In 2020, he was awarded the annual Marion Courtley Prize <clears throat> for, uh, for an article, The Mrs. Freer Case Revisited, Marriage, Morality and the State in Interwar Australia, published in History Australia. Uh, in 2019. Uh, the title of the talk that he is giving us today is Pastoralism, Aboriginal Labour and the Shift Towards Convict Transportation in Western Australia. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Jane. Um, I'm just going to share my screen um, and hopefully uh, you'll all be able to see, see my PowerPoint. Um, I also Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. I also would like to acknowledge the custodians and traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. The Wajak Noongar people are the traditional owners of the land on which the Crawley campus of UWA is situated, and the Wajak Noongar remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their value, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. So today I'm going to be talking about this part of Western Australia. Those of you who haven't uh, been to Perth, uh, the uh, map on the right is probably the one that you would want to look at first. And you can see York uh, east of Perth. Um, and the Avon Valley is basically, if you trace um, that line, which is the Avon River, more or less, from Beverly, Northern, um, through to 2J um, is the Avon Valley. So that's the part of Western Australia I'm going to be talking about today. And just to give you um, a indication of the traditional owners of uh, the land that I'm talking about today, it's the Balagong Nungar. Um, and you can see on that map on the left, um, the where, where York is. I, I don't know how clear it is for you, but it's uh, to the um, uh, east of Perth there. And also to give you an idea of what this part of um, Western Australia looks like, uh, these are some touristy pictures, but it, it really is a beautiful, beautiful uh, part of the world. Um, and is, uh, as we'll see, the uh, place in Western Australia where pastoralism was first um, established. All right. So, Ever since the establishment of the Swan River Colony in 1829, um, Western Australia's settler elite had always prided themselves on establishing a free society and had long warned of the dire consequences and polluting example derived from convict servitude. For 20 years, this founding principle had the support and backing of successive governors and the British government. 
However, by the mid 1840s, there was significant public pressure to tackle economic stagnation, a persistent labor shortage, and low immigration levels through some force, form of forced labor. And a step in this direction had already been taken in 1842 with the British government's decision to send juvenile offenders from Parkhurst prison to the colony. Five years later in 1847, Lieutenant Governor Irwin announced in the Legislative Council that he would send the colonial schooner champion to Singapore to procure Chinese indentured laborers. It was originally intended that these would be contracted for three years, two of which would be with the settlers who had sent for them originally. Later that year, the Perth Gazette noted that, quote, the whole of the Chinese immigrant, immigrants per champion had found situations. However, ever, these schemes were not enough to meet the demand for a more expansive solution to the labor problem. And from the mid 1840s, increasing numbers of settlers led by pastoralists from the Avon Valley district east of Perth mounted a pressure campaign to introduce convict labor to Western Australia. The Avon Valley pastoralists were represented by a powerful lobby group, the York Agricultural Society. Formed in 1840, the society proposed several schemes to alleviate the colony's labor shortage, and its members drafted a number of influential petitions supporting transportation from 1845. Although the activities of the York Agricultural Society are relatively well known, few historians have examined the society's push for forced labor in light of the violent dispossession of Aboriginal communities that took place along the fertile Avon Valley throughout the 1830s. What I attempt to do in this paper is to place the bloody conflict over land between Avon Valley pastoralists and Aboriginal communities in the 1830s within the same frame of analysis as the pastoralist agitation for convict transportation and other forms of forced labor the following decade. Um, and in this regard, this paper is much less a biographical analysis um, in contrast to some of the other papers in this series. However, I hope to give some kind of background context, um, given that many of the uh, important people um, that we'll be talking about over the, the next weeks and months um, had dealings with the Evan Valley. Now, one fruitful way to approach the relationship between dispossession, violence, and forced labor in Western Australia is to review the historical literature on indigenous slavery and unfree labor in the Americas in the early modern era. Most scholarship on New World slavery, of course, focuses on the millions of Africans who are captured, transported across the Atlantic, and forced to labor in horrendous conditions on plantations in the Americas and the Caribbean. Less studied is the experience of indigenous slaves defeated, captured, and bought by European traders between the 15th and 18th centuries, which numbered about 2 million all told by some estimates. Recent scholarship on Native American slavery demonstrates that not only did every major European nation with colonies in the New World participate in the enslavement of indigenous populations, but they, that these indigenous slaves were central to the success of European colonies in the New World. Collectively, indigenous slaves contrib contributed greatly to the Atlantic economy, and by the latter half of the 17th century could be found at almost every level of colonial society and in every sector of colonial economies. Furthermore, Native American slavery varied greatly over time and space, ranging from outright chattel slavery to more ambiguous forms of limited term servitude. Indigenous communities experienced slavery in different ways in different locales as colonists tried to maximize their utility and labor within the constraints of an evolving conversation about the legality of the enslavement of native populations. The relationship between enslavement of indigenous peoples and the transatlantic trade in African slaves is also closely connected. European colonizers soon realized that indigenous slavery alone could not meet their voracious demand for forced labor. On the one hand, epidemic diseases brought to the Americas via the Columbian Exchange decimated indigenous populations. On the other hand, indigenous slaves escaped across frontiers or into remote areas where control was tenuous. And in fact, much of the trade in indigenous slaves in the Americas was to overseas destinations to prevent escape. African slavery was a solution to both of these problems and provided a captive, highly dependent labor force from far away. It was much more difficult, of course, 
for Africans to in escape their enslavement. So how might this research on new world slavery help historians on forced labor in Western Australia? A first, perhaps obvious comparison is the link between violent territorial conquest and attempts to recruit Aboriginal laborers to work on pastoral stations. Conquest of territory and its settlement by pastoralists and farmers could not succeed without a dependable labor force. Much like in the Americas in the early modern era, settlers in Western Australia initially looked to the people they had dispossessed to provide the workers they needed. A, sec a second comparison is that forced labor very quickly came to be regarded by Western Australian pastoralists as a necessity. While slavery had been abolished in the British Empire in 1833, Unfree labor in its various other forms, systems of indenture, convict transportation among them, were not. In the York district, conquest of land was only the first step. Initially, pastoralists intended that the Baladong Noongar would provide a steady supply of agricultural workers who would work for and alongside Europeans. But when this supply began to dry up in the mid-1840s, some scheme of forced labor became a necessity. Between 1830 and 1840, um, the Avon Valley District of Western Australia was explored, invaded, and settled by British colonists. Although settlers attempted to ignore the sovereignty of the indigenous communities who had occupied this region for millennia, throughout the 1830s, the Baladong Noongar mounted a steadfast defense of their independence, their country, and their livelihood. While aspects of the violent conquest of the Avon Valley have been researched and written about by Neville Green, Donald Garden, and Anne Hunter, these are all brief accounts that focus mainly of the events of 1836-1837. Now, the imposition of settler sovereignty over the Avon Valley was achieved in several stages. First, the establishment of agricultural and pastoral operations in the Avon Valley severely disrupted Noongar hunting and foraging practices. Settlers' hunting of native wildlife and running of sheep were particularly damaging, and the consequent loss of food security weakened communities whose sovereignty was based on ready access to their country and the flora and fauna within it. Secondly, the Baladong overtly resisted the settler invasion of the Avon Valley. Existing accounts, intentionally or not, tend to portray the Noongar as passive victims of colonial violence. The evidence, however, suggests a much more active resistance of which raiding settler food supplies was just one component. Throughout the, 18, th throughout the 1830s, there were numerous planned attacks on settlers and their homesteads, even though the consequences for Baladon communities were often fatal. Thirdly, settler sovereignty over the Avon Valley was largely achieved through the blunt instrument of extrajudicial violence. It was only in the 1840s that the extrajudicial violence, that this extrajudicial violence was replaced by more conventional state-sanctioned judicial control. Summary punishments, including murder, were encouraged and endorsed by James Sterling, the governor, who authorized military officers, civil officials, and settlers to use whatever means were necessary to defeat the Noongar resistance. There were few voices raised against the so-called Pinjara spirit, a phrase used by Justiniani, one of the few uh, or small handful of critics, and there were few legal consequences, even for those settlers who openly flouted the law and committed atrocities. Europeans had discovered the Avon Valley in 1830, just one year after the establishment of the Swan River Colony. And when Ensign and Robin Dale and others crossed the Darling Escarpment in that year, they soon became aware of the extensive and long-standing indigenous presence in this fertile, well-watered region. Dale's pioneering ex expedition in August 1830 encountered several groups of Baladong Noongar people, including hunting parties, and Lieutenant Archibald Erskine's expedition the following month reported being met by natives, quote, whom we found fishing on the banks of the Avon River. Both officers also encountered evidence of permanent habitation of long duration, including rock art in a cave in the Diet Hills. However, the sovereign right of the Baladong to the land on which they lived was barely acknowledged by the colonial administration, which began to process settlers' applications for land grants in the Avon Valley towards the end of 1830. The focal point of the new settlement was the townside of York at the base of Mount Bakewell, 
from which land grants stretched in a strip up to 15 kilometers wide along the river, southwards and northwards. And although the apportionment of land progressed swiftly, actual settlement of the new grants did not follow immediately, with several of the successful applicants content for several years to engage in land speculation from the comfort of Perth or Guildford. Initial occupation of the area around York did proceed in the spring of 1831. However, the piecemeal nature of the early occupation is evidenced by the fact that by July 1832, only 18 settlers and four soldiers resided in the Avon Valley as a whole. Among the pioneering settlers Dale escorted to the valley in 1831 was Rabbit Henry Bland, who in partnership with Arthur Trimmer would establish the first pastoral station in the region and in the colony as a whole. Early explorers' reports had indicated York and its environs would be much better suited to the raising of sheep than the Swan Coastal Plain. And once Trimmer successfully exported a small packet of wool to England in 1832, Western Australians Western Australia's nascent pastoral industry was brought into being. By late 1834, the Swan had been nearly abandoned as a sheep district, with half the colony's sheep at York, and by 1836, sheep numbers had risen to about 5,000. In addition to raising sheep, early settlers in the Avon Valley also tended small herds of cattle to produce milk, butter, and cheese, and planted wheat, barley, and garden crops to supplement wildlife and other food gathered from the environment. Although the number of settlers who moved to the Avon Valley in the early 1830s was small, their expanding agricultural and pastoral activities rapidly Im impacted upon Balladong foraging and hunting practices. Um, Patterson notes that systems of wild harvesting and natural cultivation across Australia were disrupted by the arrival of sheep and cattle, which consumed root plants and assisted the spread of new invasive species through grazing and the transformation of the top soil through hooves. Flocks of sheep in the Avon Valley were dis dispersed over a large area and, and in addition to eating large amounts of plants and grasses, depended upon the same water sources that indigenous communities relied on for fishing and drinking, especially in the dry summer months. Settlers also shot significant numbers of kangaroos, waterfowl and other wildlife, reducing a key food source. The extent of the disruption was already evident by late 1832, when Robert Lyon wrote in a letter to the colonial office that, quote, the, no the natives were finding that the settlers were greatly lessening the number of their kangaroos, opossums, and birds, and that they were driven from all their fishing stations. In late 1836, the government's interpreter to the native tribes, Francis Armstrong, published an account which succinctly illustrated the devastating impact of colonial settlement on Noongar community's ability to forage and hunt. Armstrong's informants recounted how, when Europeans first arrived in the country, some of them became hostilely disposed to the settlers, but others cared or thought little about it until they began to find the kangaroo and other game getting alarmingly scarce. Before long, these communities were dependent on bread, rice, sugar, and other food supplied by the newcomers. However, even if the colonists were now to leave, quote, they would not be placed in the same condition as when we first came because the game is nearly all driven away and what remains is very much shy. The emerging agricultural and pastoral industries in the Avon Valley were particularly disruptive to traditional foraging and hunting, but they also exposed the vulnerability of the small settler community across the hills who were effectively cut off from the seat of government in Perth. Newly established farmhouses were at a distance from one another. Shepherds tending sheep and cattle were isolated and alone for long stretches of time, and grain and flower stores were often unattended. Moreover, in the summer, Noongar burning practices regularly threatened homes and fields. In April 1832, James Sterling himself summed up the situation when he reported to London that settlers were, quote, safe enough in our houses or when prepared for attack, but are never so when absent from home or unprepared. Stock are also safe when there are two or three white persons present on the spot, but when the cattle or sheep stray, they are but too likely to be attacked. Even with every precaution, outrages can neither be in all cases prevented nor punished. As early as 1830, there are indications that the reception of the Baladong to the colonial incursion of their country was far from welcoming. 
and this resistance became more overt once the first settlers arrived in the Avon Valley in 1831. One of these pioneers was Dubois Agate, who attempted to establish a small farm at York in 1831, before moving some years later to his large land grant on the eastern bank of the Avon River close to Northern. Agate's first uh, effort to occupy the farm at York was short-lived when his farm uh, uh, farmhouse was burnt down uh, several times um, uh, deliberately by a Baladong party. The first recorded fatal attack on settlers in the Avon Valley region occurred in early 1832, when the driver of a bullock team and a boy going over the mountains in January were attacked, apparently without any cause. The boy was killed, most inhumanely reported uh, the Perth Gazette, but the man, although se severely wounded, escaped. As a consequence of this violence, the colonial administration ordered the establishment of a military outpost at York with four soldiers assigned to conduct regular patrols and to provide protection. The Baladong's attempts to defend their country from invasion were met with swift and violent retribution by settlers and soldiers. Robert Lyon was one of the few colonists willing, op willing openly to criticize the Sterling administration for turning a blind eye to mounting evidence of murder and other violent atrocities, not only at York, but throughout the colony. He would later lament that it was painful to reflect that the rightful owners of the country are killed day after day by our own people without trial by either judge or jury, and often in mere sport, though they are styled in the government proclamations as British subjects. One particularly egregious incident of unprovoked, unprovoked extrajudicial mass killing in the Avon Valley occurred at some point in 1832, with Lyon recording that, quote, the settlers and soldiers at York have committed a horrible action. They went at night to an encampment of the natives, and while they were sitting around their fires, poured the shot among them, men, women, and children. Their cries were dreadful, end quote. The violence was often extreme and frequent, frequently disproportionate. It was obvious by the end of 1833 that the running of sheep in the valley had become a flashpoint for violence. And in August that year, an affray with the natives at York, that's a quote, took place after they were caught in the act of spearing sheep and were consequently fired upon. By 1835, as increasing numbers of prospective farmers and pastoralists were making their way over the hills, the Baladong mounted more forceful action in defense of their lands. Settlers' livestock and food supplies were often targeted, also indicating that tra traditional food sources were coming under strain. In May 1835, James Twine and George Morphy were engaged in driving a shock of a flock of sheep to the Avon Valley when they were speared. Um, the following month, Bland and Trimmer, the two pastoralists, were ambushed on the York Road, quote, by a party of about 12 who rushed forward from their place of their concealment. In response to these incidents, the Perth Gazette warned darkly that, quote, the natives had become emboldened by the rep repetition of aggressions which have not been chastised. And that, quote, unless some decisive measures are adopted to check their daring practices, they will before long organize themselves into a formidable band which will require a second Pinjara encounter to exterminate. Land and Trimmer were again the target of an of an attack in July 1835, when uh, uh, they suffered a loss of 16 pigs speared and carried off. However, it was not until the winter of 1836 that severe violence again erupted into view, and the proposals for a larger military force were brought into effect. On the morning of 18th of June 1836, Private Michael McNamara, who had been assigned to protect the, the, the farm of James Solomon, heard dogs barking at the store. Once he confirmed um, that uh, a party were trying to get into the storehouse, he Im immediately set dogs on them. Then he and two other armed men confronted the thieves and made an attempt to detain them. A struggle ensued, shots were fired, and McNamara killed two men with his musket. Concerned that the killing of two uh, Baladong men would quickly lead to uh, retaliation, Sterling, had come to believe that, quote, in respect of the natives, uh, of the natives in the York district, a hostile and most dangerous feeling appeared to exist among them, and that they exhibit a greater form of combination and of concerted plan. 
than he had ever known them to possess, end quote. Sterling's worries about combination and a concerted attack on settled properties at York were e echoed by others, including Dubois Agate. He warned, Agate did, that the natives have lately become very troublesome in my neighborhood and appeared to be perfectly aware that we shall be unable to offer resistance during the time of the rains. Agate recounted that he had recently warned a group of Baladong men that if they stole again, they would be shot. But those men had instantly replied to him that, quote, they would spare a white man for every, every black man that was killed. Further, that when the river ran, the soldiers not, could not come to our assistance and they would muster a great many together and our houses being afar apart, they could throw a great many spear, spears at us whilst we were firing guns. Um, Agate also admitted um, that he was very unable, he was unable to control um, those who he tried to uh, employ, admitting that flogging, using flogging as a punishment, but that it was, quote, a mere farce, they care no longer about it, and suggested that the only, the sight of a soldier and nothing but a soldier could act as effective deterrent. Sterling uh, e evidently agreed with these concerns and quickly dispatched 10 men to the York district under the command of Lieutenant Henry Bunbury of the 21st Fusiliers. Bunbury clearly obeyed Sterling's uh, orders. In a letter written two weeks into his deployment at York, he noted that, quote, I was ordered over here with a detachment to make war upon the natives who have been very troublesome lately, even attempting to spear white people. While he found patrolling the valley in the frost and rain of winter very fatiguing and disagreeable, he was hopeful that it would not last long, quote, as the natives seem inclined to be quiet since I shot a few of them one night. The extent to which Bunbury and his troops made war upon the Baladong in June and July of 1836 is difficult to assess. The Perth Gazette, which was reliably in favor of Sterling's decision to take salutary measures, has few reports of conflict and does not explicitly mention Bunbury's night shooting. However, there is one brief story that hints at this in incident, and incident and suggests that Bunbury's use of violence was indiscriminate. Several days prior to that attack, um, a soldier had been speared and while he was not killed, he had been badly uh, injured. And it was supposed that this attack was in direct retaliation for the two men that had been killed by Private McNamara. On 9th of July uh, of that year, the Perth Gazette published the following account. It has been reported that an attack was made upon the natives at York at night. Several, it is supposed, were wounded and one woman was killed. We hope to hear that there is no truth in this rumor. Um, it is a disgrace to the parties implicated in it. It is not alone in politic but it ill becomes us to commence such a system of attack. However, nothing was ever mentioned again, um, and Sterling seems to have uh, made no further inquiry. In any event, it would seem that Bunbury's decision to use overwhelming force succeeded in weakening Baladong resistance, at least in the short term. At a meeting of the Executive Council held on the 21st of July of 1836, Sterling announced its that uh, nothing had occurred at York to render the adoption of further measures necessary. And Bunbury returned to Perth. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit other than, and, and just uh, uh, make the point that um, it's later on in the following year with a number of other attacks that sees um, uh, a, a really, a, a, a huge uptick in the colonial um, response to a Baladong resistance. Um, uh, in particular, uh, the uh, killing of two men, Chidlow and Jones, set off a wave of fear throughout the Avon Valley that extended to the colony at large. This is in 1837. Sterling immediately dis dispatched Bunbury again to York with a mounted party to augment the existing military force there. Um, and he was also told, Bunbury was, by Sterling again, to use proper examples of severity to the full extent which the law warrants in such cases. Um, certainly, uh, these most effectual measures were again used 
um, and there were very few consequences when Bunbury uh, didn't follow the letter of the law. Shortly, shortly after Bunbury's arrival, he reported to Sterling that he had gone out with an armed party to look for the murderers of Jones and Chidlow and had shot a number of uh, two men in, who he said had been endeavoring to escape. Bunbury also warned Sterling that the state of this district is at the present moment, moment most alarming and that, quote, it would not only be injudicious, but would lead to great loss of life to act strictly according to law by apprehending the perpetrators of the late dreadful murders, since the natives have now repeatedly at different farms expressed their determination to spare a white man for every native either killed or apprehended. As we are not at present sufficiently strong to guard effectively uh, all the farms in this district, as well as the, as the stock, which is necessarily much dispersed, it appears to me necessary by severe measures to deter the natives from the commission of further outrage. Sterling's reaction to Bunbury's proposal to flout the law and employ severe measures was, quote, to express satisfaction at the promptitude you have displayed for the protection of the district and to inform Bunbury that he relied with confidence on your adopting such further methods for quelling the turbulence of the natives as the circumstances of the district may render necessary. Uh, there were uh, further um, attacks uh, on um, men at night as well as on uh, uh, camp, uh, camps um, around the fire um, in the dark, which is something that Bunbury had done before as well. Um, at a well-attended meeting of the Agricultural Society at Guildford, members passed resolutions condemning the continued and unprovoked aggressions and atrocities committed on the lives and property of the settlers, requesting the augmentation of the military force defending the colony and declaring that, quote, the District of York may be considered at present in a state of war and that the meeting concurs unanimously in the necessity of adopting the strongest and most energetic methods to bring it to a speedy termination. Members offered their personal services in cooperation with the local government to ensure the security of the districts in which they resided. The Perth Gazette also expressed its full approbation of Sterling's actions. Jones and Chidlow's murders had called for a severe and well-merited chastisement, the newspaper said, and thus the fatal shootings by Bunbury, McLeod and Mortimer in response were just retribution for the inhuman and savage attack made by the Aborigines upon those two unoffending in individuals, end quote. It was also convinced that nothing short of a bold and daring display of our superiority would effectively eradicate from the mind of um, the savage the impression that we may be plundered and murdered with impunity, end quote. Two weeks later, the newspaper reiterated that a greater impression is made upon the mind of the savage by summary punishment and a strong example than by all the parade and farce of legal proceedings, and that no retaliation followed the wholesome chastisement inflicted at Pan Panjara, where settlers were now located in perfect amity. The exaction of summary punishment continued to characterize Bunbury's military operations in the Avon Valley. In another report that he submitted to Sterling, he admitted killing a man named Durdum, who he described as about the worst character in the whole district. And he claimed that this man had been employed by Jones and Chidlow in herding cattle for several months, but left them that very morning to join the other natives in sparing them. One night, about six miles from Agate's farm, Bunbury's party were in pursuit of this uh, person and another man who were running for their lives when a long shot by moonlight, quote, stopped Dur Durdum's career. Bunbury rationalized the soldier's actions by claiming that it was evident from the boldness and insolence of this party that they felt themselves very strong and that the shouts and cries heard on the surrounding hills proved that, quote, a large body of natives had collected for the plunder of the place if the more daring of their party had succeeded in overpowering the white men. Bunbury also noted that, quote, a native who was in custody in the York barracks had been shot by one of the soldiers during his absence from the town, town site. The Perth Gazette later claimed that the shooting 
occurred while the detained man was in the act of making an escape. Another shooting occurred at York when it was noticed that a man had climbed a tree and as it was supposed that he was placed there as a spy, he was instantly shot. The newspaper admitted there was some reason to believe that the victim was, quote, merely up there for the purpose of hunting the opossum. But even so, such appears to be the imperious necessity for prompt measures and the strictest vigilance that much as me, we may lament the occurrence, if the, if the native was innocent of any improper motive, the circumstance of his being in that suspicious position will in a great measure, will be in a great measure palliative of the offense, end quote. Extrajudicial murders were not only committed by the military and civil authorities in the York district. Dr. Louis Justiniani, a missionary uh, appointed by the Western Australian Missionary Society, who had advocated for the colony's indigenous inhabitants since his arrival in 1836, formally complained to the government about atrocities committed by prominent Avon Valley settlers. In a, set, in a letter sent in August 1837 to the colonial secretary, he stated that several persons from Guildford were prepared to testify how Arthur Trimmer, with a party of other such gentlemen, who under the pretext of hunting, would destroy all the uh, Aboriginal inhabitants they can meet, and that Mr. Trimmer himself will kill indiscriminately 10 natives." End quote. When these formal complaints went unanswered, Justiniani turned to the pages of the Swan River Guardian to publicize the atrocities. In a series of open letters addressed to the colonial office, he detailed how settlers had maimed, murdered, and mutilated Noongar people with impunity. He described barbarities of the Middle Age, committed, quote, even by boys and servants who shot the unarmed woman, the unoffensive child, and the men who kindly showed them the road in the bush. A particularly horrific incident took place at York when Mr. Super shot a native woman and wounded a native man, and the ears were cut off from the dead body and hung up in Mr. Trimmer's kitchen as a trophy, being the next house to the government resident, and still he was never tried, end quote. Justiniani also accused a military party led by McLeod and Bunbury of murdering 18 innocent victims. All right, I'm going to skip ahead again um, and uh, come to the end in, the 18, in 1840 when um, by this stage uh, the resistance to um, the colonial incursion, the overt resistance to the colonial incursion had come to an end. So once resistance to the settler incursion had been broken in the York district by 1840, Baladon communities became increasingly dependent on seasonal labor in order to survive. York settlers were especially willing to employ Aboriginal laborers. And as Green points out, this willingness needs to be viewed in the light of the rapid agricultural development of the district. During 1840, in 1841, the population of sheep increased by 60%, cattle by 50%, and crop acreage by 50% as well. However, during the same period, the increase in, white, in the white labor force was negligible. At a time when the supply of unskilled labor could not meet the demand for it in York, Noongar laborers became indispensable as shepherds or as seasonal harvest time workers. The coercive nature of the relationship between the settler pastoralists and Baladong workers was never far from the surface. For example, a Perth Gazette editorial of 19th of August 1837 proposed, quote, to try the experiment of working the unruly natives on the roads or informing other improvements. We are of opinion it may be attended with a favorable result. If those confined in the Fremantle jail for attacks on settlers at York are convicted, a good opportunity will present itself to make the attempt. The natives convicted of theft or other aggressions, if the plan and agitation is brought to bear, will be chained to a wheelbarrow and will be compelled to perform so much work as their strength will enable them. A file of soldiers will be required as a guard to deter the relatives of the captured offenders from making any attempt to rescue them. Two years later, in July 1839, the same newspaper remarked that the York district, which had, quote, been lately disturbed by the aggressions of the natives, was now partially restored to a state of tranquility. 
Even so, caution and vigilance in the in intercourse with the natives was still required. For, quote, the scarcity of labor in the colony renders it necessary to employ the Aborigines in herding cattle and tending sheep. We hear with pleasure that their services are considered val valuable and that no apprehensions are entertained by the settlers of their abusing the confidence reposed in them. And the quote goes on to say, these blacks are, however, a singular race, and it will require many years of experimental suffering and forbearance on both sides, on the part of the whites as well as the blacks, to bring them to any conception of our laws or adherence to our habits. The York Agricultural Society itself, which was formed in 1840, noted in its first uh, report that we have, uh, that they had happiness in stating that the conduct of the natives um, had been peaceable, and at various times there had been a great assistance to settlers in herding cattle and other occupations, though as yet but little has, had been done to civilize or wean them from their savage habits." End quote. These reports then bear out the argument made by Green that during the 1840s, indigenous workers in the Avon Valley remained closely associated with their land and the traditional food harvests. In the summer, when bush foods were plentiful, rations of flour were an insufficient incentive to remain in the employment of white settlers, who regarded Noongar workers as unreliable and insufficient for their needs. Thus, just as the expansion of the settlement at York increased the demand for labour, Aboriginal people themselves were still, quote, unwilling to lose their freedom and accept regular employment. Settlers had hoped that through conquest and by restricting Indigenous access to land, they would create a reliable cheap labour force dependent on food rations at homesteads and on pastoral stations. However, this reality never eventuated. In fact, by the mid-1840s, the number of Aboriginal workers in the valley had begun to decline. In his annual report published in February of 1845, um, Thomas Yule, who was a protector of Aborigine, Aborigines, um, wrote of, quote, their general good conduct and the mutual kindly feeling which subsists between them and the white population. There had been few criminal cases in the previous year, and the tribes which had been in the habits of intercourse with the white population maintained the greatest confidence in them, which is seldom abused. However, while many were still employed by the settlers, he thought that the numbers were not so great regularly as a year or two since. They make valuable herds for cattle, horses, swine, etc. And some of those who have undergone a period of punishment on the island of Rotnest have become expert at reaping and other agri agricultural labors. Their appearance generally in the occupied districts is more robust and muscular than before the settlement of the country, though their numbers are as certainly gradually decreasing. Why these numbers are decreasing is still something um, that I'm in the process of researching. There certainly are indications of uh, some uh, family groups moving away from the York or Avon Valley um, district altogether and moving to the south and to the east to escape um, uh, the, the settler occupation. So it's in this context in which the pressure to establish a reliable system of forced labor built up at York especially among the influential pastoralists who made up the membership of the York Agricultural Society. As one commentator explained, from the first peopling of the Avon Valley, the clearing of land and tillage went on as rapidly as could be expected from the limited supply of labor up to 1843 and 1844. But since this last mentioned period, little or nothing has been done. The Parkhurst boys for some two or three years past have led the van of operations among the farmers. I might almost say that by this labor alone, farms have been kept from total ruin. As for uh, uh, Avon district settlers who sent a memorial to the governor in 1848, they wrote that the present great scarcity of labor had arisen chiefly from the emigration of several of the working classes, from several of the working men taking farms and becoming employers. Scarcity of labor was, above all others, the greatest evil that they labored under, and they felt great pleasure in bearing testimony to the benefit likely to arise from the introduction of, the Ch of Chinese indentured workers, a measure, they said, that had been adopted for our immediate relief by your predecessor, i.e. the governor's predecessor, Irwin. But however useful they may be 
as auxiliaries, they can never in various departments of farm labor take the place of Europeans. Jeremy, what? sorry. Okay. It's quarter two, just to All right, I'll, 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 I'll uh, finish up. So white laborers were unwilling to take up work in the pastoral sector and Aboriginal labor was not only scarce, but also very difficult to control. To these uh, uh, employers, forced labor of some sort had become a necessity. To uh, conclude, T. Mellish, who was a pastoralist from York, wrote in July 1847 on the subject of labor that he thought it did not require any very erudite political economist to know that in a young country where labor is essential and indispensable to the full development of its natural resources, that it is of greater value than capital. Indeed, that one is useless without the other. Forced labor was required. Thank you very much. Wakefield as well. Uh, wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so, I'm going to move straight on now to the questions and answers, but I'm going to jump in myself first. Uh, and um, so please, you know, audience members do uh, ask questions through the Q&A function, uh, or if you're part of the live audience, please ask your question too. But my question, Jeremy, is you referred early on to the Pinjara spirit and the, crit the critique by um, the humanitarian Justiniani. So you're referring obviously to the Pinjara massacre of 1834, which is perhaps the most well-known clash that took place in the colony of Swan River. Um, but the incidents, the sort of process that you've just outlined began really in 1832. And then, you know, you said there was a big uptick in 1832. Um, as well, and then 1837. So in other words, both sides of the Pinjara massacre. So I'm just wondering, did the, like, is there a relationship? Did the Pinjara massacre, you know, come into debates about the Avon Valley? And why is the Pinjara massacre so visible to us now, you know, compared to the, the relative obscurity of this history that you're really uncovering in detail for the first time? Yeah, I, I would answer to say that, um, I think violence in Swan River is um, evident from as early as 1830. So within, you know, less than a year of the uh, arrival of settlers. And there are, for example, reports in 1830 of um, a skirmish at Lake Munger uh, in Perth. So I think, uh, and if you look carefully, you can see every few weeks or so, there are uh, reports of um, low level conflict which sometimes, of, of course, kind of breaks out. Um, uh, the capture of um, and ex execution of Mijaguru, for example, is, is another example of that. Um, Pinjara, I think, is important uh, both at the time and since, A, because of the scale of, um, of, of, of the massacre, although you know, exact numbers are, are hard to come by, anywhere between 15 and 200 um, people were killed. And there are some accounts that say that there are large numbers of um, uh, dead bodies either floating down um, the river or being, being uh, buried in a hole. Settlers at the time saw it for what it was, which was an explicitly punitive um, event. Sterling uh, went out on purpose uh, to kill large numbers of people to make a point that resistance would um, be uh, squashed. And I think that's, it's bearing, the Pinjara mask is bearing on what's going on in the Avon Valley. I think uh, settlers see that kind of approach as being effective in um, tamping down resistance, overt resistance. And so they um, several times explicitly mentioned Pinjara as a way of, um, if not goading on the colonial authorities, certainly justifying the kind of violence that we see there, the extrajudicial violence, as well as that carried out by uh, Bunbury and the military. Right, thank you. Uh, and then uh, I did have another question, but there is, um, maybe come back to that. Jenny Gregory um, has made a couple of comments and has asked, had, me had measles struck Avon Valley by the late 1840s or 50s? Um, yeah, so that, that is uh, 
her, her question. I, I'm not sure. I haven't come across, uh, that's not to say that there aren't, uh, you know, newspaper reports. In fact, I should probably have a closer look at that. It's possible. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll have to, to look into that, but no, I don't know. Okay. Um, maybe, yep. She, and she's just noted, terrific paper, research by Shane Burke and Catherine Roscoe in the um, carceral colony issue of studies in Western Australian history. That's one of the most recent. Um, on Aboriginal road gangs in late 1840s and 50s would be useful. Uh, and also an article by Bob Reese in Push from the Bush on Perth in 1838, who describes the fear of settlers who saw Aboriginal people fighting in St George's Terrace. So that's interesting, that urban frontier um, or urbanising frontier that Penny Edmonds refers to as well. Um, I, um, so I did have um, another question. Uh, let me see. I hope I'm not missing. Oh, here we are. Steve Brown. I'm wondering about the comment about Aboriginal farm labourers being skilled at reaping and other agricultural labours. Did the 1830s invaders make the connection between Aboriginal and colonial settler agricultural practices? Um, I think the uh, reference to reaping is in particular to um, prisoners who had been taken to Rotnest. And one of the um, kind of, I guess, disciplinary regimes on Rotnest was um, to teach uh, agricultural skills um, on the island. So I think that's what that specific reference is uh, to reaping, that um, when uh, these uh, men were returned from Rotnest uh, and taken back to um, the Avon Valley, that they had now had skills that could be used on the pastoral stations or on the farms. Um, so in terms of connections between Abor Aboriginal and colonial agricultural practices, in general, uh, settlers are very disparaging of um, Aboriginal uh, agricultural practices as much as they even recognise them. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so Rowena Hall asks, uh, do you know what the first case of ear trophies was prior to this Bunbury example you gave? So the, it's not, the Bun Bunbury I don't think refers specifically to that, although he does, he thinks very little of Trimmer, the pastoralist. Um, in another part of his letters, he, he really disparages him and, and calls his kind of masculinity and uh, civilization into question. Uh, and it could be in response to that uh, incident. Uh, it's Justiniani who is the one who um, makes these allegations at, at several times. So he makes uh, an attempt privately to uh, write to the colonial secretary in Perth the, um, uh, and to Sterling to complain. When he gets no response from that, that's when he publishes those allegations in the newspaper. Um, they're rejected. He's um, more or less hounded out of the colony, really, uh, Justiniani is. And is, um, yeah, that's, that's all I know. I mean, I've, I've got those from a letter yeah. in the State Records Office and also from this one, River Guardian, which is the, the newspaper that Justiniani uh, published his allegations in. And I, I wonder, too, whether um, it would be interesting to consider other examples of that practice. So, for example, in Queensland, um, that was reported by yeah. by settlers at particular moments. Um, so, ne yeah, Neville yeah. Green also yeah. makes a, a point, and I don't, I haven't managed to find the original of, of this, but that um, some of the um, pastoralists intentionally buried um, the dead on their properties to because they believed there was a spiritual um, superstition or belief that would prevent um, attacks. Where, uh, uh, so I've only come across what Neville Green says about that, and I haven't found the originals, but it's possible also that uh, this awful practice was, also, was in some way justified mm. or rationalised in that way. I'm not sure. Although, as Jane says, I mean, it's hardly unique to Western Australia. You see that kind of stuff in South Africa and, and elsewhere. Mm. Okay. Um, so a comment from Janet Osborne, who notes that there was measles among the Wajak Noongar in Perth in the mid-1840s, 
and a lot of movement of people between Wadjuk and Baladon country. So she's suggesting that there would have been measles at York at the same period. That sounds very uh, reasonable. Yeah, yeah that sounds yeah. very reasonable. No, thank uh, you. I hadn't really, and I, to be honest, I hadn't really thought about the impact of disease um, in terms of uh, what what happens with um, the reduction in in numbers. Uh, I, I I don't. Again, I haven't looked closely, but whether or not settlers would have made um, reference in newspapers to large numbers of deaths, or whether um, so whether these were ignored or whether uh, settlers were aware, I'm not sure. Um, it'll be interesting to know, um, and I'll have a look at other people's research as well to see, to see because I think it's a very important um, consideration. Mm. Uh, Stephanie Tarbin asks, is there much evidence of settler efforts to train up Aboriginal children as agricultural workers in the first decade or two of settlement? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, there, is, there are certainly uh, references to apprentices and you often get the sense from the way in which reports are written that a lot of the shepherds are very young. How young exactly, is, it's not clear. And there's an interesting kind of transition between European shepherds and Aboriginal shepherds, as far as I can tell, which happens in the 1840s. And one of the complaints actually that the, um, the protector makes is that some of the white shepherds are, um, I mean, reading between the lines, are sexually assaulting uh, black women and that um, he's very concerned about that. And I'm wondering whether perhaps some of the transition to, um, uh, having uh, indigenous, young indigenous men as shepherds was uh, a response to that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Janet Osborne has also provided um, a reference uh, for a chilling description of a Noongar skull set above the doorway of the Staunton Springs Homestead Grain Store. Uh, so I might get that reference later. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and another reference that occurred to me in relation to Steph's question is um, Brian Wills Johnson's master's thesis, which he finished a couple of years ago on Yonke Yonka, who worked as I think a nine or 10 year old Aboriginal shepherd um, in the region. So that might yeah. be an interesting case study as well. Um, so there aren't, I cannot see any fresh questions at the moment. So I'm going to just quickly jump in and ask my question in a couple of minutes that we have left, which is just about um, all the names of some of the um, figures that you mentioned. Uh, have you yet had the opportunity to sort of check their relationship to the Legacies of British Slavery database hosted by University College London? Um, I think we talked about Leonard um, is one of the pastoralists who, who was a substantial beneficiary. And of course, in my seminar, I talked about Ridley and Walcott, who then took up acreage yeah. in that region. Um, is that something that you've... Had yes, I have put people's names in just to see. Um, Trimmer doesn't seem to have any um, uh, link to the LBS database. Um, and uh, the other pastorals that I mentioned in this, I've also had a look at and haven't uh, noticed direct uh, accounts. I mean, one of the things I am interested in though, and I don't know how easy it will be as this research proceeds, is to get a sense of um, whether people like Ridley, for example, um, and Walcott and others had, um, what, what kind of voice they had on the York Agricultural Society. Um, again, it'll be a kind of indirect thing, I suppose, but there are definitely discussions about labor, about labor, the use of flogging, for example, um, which I think, you know, your my, my certainly my, you know, impulse would be to say that there's there, there's probably some kind of link there, um, but yeah. then again, I mean, I don't think you need to have that link to slavery to um, engage in 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 kind of coercive labour practices. So it's a it's a difficult one to to try mm -hmm. and um, tease out. I think absolutely, and it's yes, indeed. Um, I don't think we have any further questions and we're right on the hour. So might finish up there and um, say thank you very much. That was a really interesting, fantastic seminar. Thank you very much. I'll end it now. Okay. Thank you, appreciate thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.